everybody, and especially welcome to those watching on uh, YouTube. Let's say a prayer to begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, you chose to share our human nature to redeem all people and to heal the sick. Look with compassion upon our terminally ill brothers and sisters. Support them with your power, comfort them with your protection, and give them the strength to fight against evil. Since you have given them a share in your own passion, help them to find hope in suffering, for you are Lord forever and ever. Amen. It's my pleasure to introduce Chris DeBono, who is a Vice President in Providence Healthcare, which is the Catholic cluster of hospitals and healthcare facilities in the Lower Mainland, which recently added St. Joseph's Hospital in Comox in the Vancouver Island. Uh, Providence is at really the cutting edge of responding to the latest situation we have to face, the latest uh, threat to life. And so I'm grateful that he came. He spent the day with priests today and he consented to stay and speak to everybody else as well. So welcome, Chris. Thank you. So good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here tonight to speak with you. And today, the, the topic that I've been asked to talk about is one that's very dear to my heart as well. It is understanding in a better way the ethical and pastoral issues related to medical assistance in dying. And for the title slide on my, my presentation, I chose a, a, a tree that's buffeted by the winds because in a way, what we're going to talk about tonight is about a, a major sea change or a wind change in how we understand responding to suffering, what the legal changes have been, and what the Catholic opportunities are in this new reality. So one never thinks alone, and in this case, I've got behind me a number of names of people that I've been thinking with, including people from the Canadian Catholic Bioethics Institute in Toronto, people at my own organization at Providence Healthcare, and people across uh, through the Catholic Health Alliance of Canada, of which we're a member. But one of the things I always like to do when I think about end-of-life questions and talk with people about end-of-life questions is to remind myself to start, but I think I, I would encourage you to do the same, that we're really talking about our own family members, members in our parishes, vulnerable persons, uh, who have died. So I dedicate this talk in particular to my brother, one of three brothers that I have, who died way too early of, of kidney cancer in 2014. Um, he had no hair, and as you can tell back then, I had more hair. <laughs> when we gather tonight, I want to be cognizant that we're, there's a large group of us in the room, but there are also people in a webinar format. So I recognize that um, to make this work and to ensure confidentiality for everyone here, I'll speak for the first uh, 45 or 50 minutes and then afterwards we'll be able to turn the, the TV off and have some interactive conversation so that makes everybody free to talk without their voice being recorded. I also really give thanks for the variety of people as I moved around the room here greeting people. Uh, we come from many walks of life so I'm hoping that aspects of this conversation will get you to think about your own understanding of medical assistance in dying, and more importantly, how you will live a response to that within the Catholic tradition. So I'm really going to invite you to serious reflection, and uh, of course this is webcast, so don't say anything out there if you don't want your voice recorded in the interim, um, and afterwards we'll have a time for group discussion. So what do I want to do with you in this period of time? Well, tonight, I want to do a brief survey of how the legal changes that have come to make medical systems and dying legal in Canada have taken place so that you understand the facts and the terminology of what is called medical systems and dying. I want to explore as well what the ethical, legal, and pastoral challenges that this poses for people that work in healthcare, our clergy, healthcare staff, and interestingly, important challenges that it poses for Catholic healthcare organizations. I want to explore in a deep way what are the tensions that this brings forward, because I'm going to argue that, that medical assistance in dying obviously poses things that we cannot do in Catholic healthcare or Catholic approach, 
but it also asks us to deeply think about the kinds of suffering that make somebody want to end their life in this way. So I want you and I to emerge out of this conversation with a better sense of what we can do, whether we're clergy, whether we're faith communities, whether we're chaplains, whether we're family members, when responding to that suffering. And I'll end with a short reflection on the value of your hospice here in Prince George. But all of this is meant to start with an understanding that what does medicine do? And for this, in terms of the work that I do, I turn to the work of, of the MD Castle, Eric Castle, who suggested that medicine must always seek to relieve suffering and cure disease when possible. And you'll see why that idea of responding to suffering is important to me. So who am I and why did uh, Bishop Jensen invite me to come up to talk to you? I think it'll give you a little bit of a sense of where I'm coming from. So I have three hats that I wear. I'm, I'm a trained clinical chaplain in the Roman Catholic tradition and did that for many years and uh, certified through the Canadian Association for Pastoral Care, now called the Canadian Association for Spiritual Care. I'm also a pastoral theologian, so my doctoral work is in the area of thinking about the intersection of faith and health. In particular, I'm interested in mental health and spirituality. And after I did my PhD, I went on to do a postdoc in clinical and organizational ethics. So ethicists are the kinds of people that help organizations and people critically think about hard healthcare decisions, be they what should we do in terms of this proposal of care for, for one of our loved ones, what do we do in the ICU, etc. Ethicists help people make principle-based decisions. And as uh, Bishop Jensen said, I'm proud and pleased and humble to serve as the Vice President of Mission Ethics and Spirituality for Providence Healthcare. So just a little bit of a disclosure. This is a conversation about important issues. It's not an ethics consult. And I'm going to be using two words um, that the media is using to describe this. And then I want to drill down and understand in a more deeply sense what, what the Catholic tradition has called this. So med M-A-I-D, sometimes called MAID, is an acronym for Medical Assistance in Dying. I'm going to parse that out. And P-A-D is a term that was used earlier on called Physician Assisted Death or Dying. So the term MAID, which is the commonly seen term that you'll see in the newspapers and media, stands for when a physician or a nurse practitioner provides or administers medication that intentionally brings about a patient's death at the request of that patient. So this is just the definitional part that I'm building. What you need to notice in that definition is the, either the provision or the administration of a medication that has as its intent the death of a patient, and the patient is asking for this. The provision in this case is done in one of two ways. We provide assisted suicide by medication that is ingested by a patient. And again, in this case, what that definition means is the patient self-administers the lethal drug because the patient intends him or herself to cause death as a way of relieving their suffering. The patient's death is actually caused by the medication. This intentionality will become more clear as, as I develop this train of thought. And the medication that's given by the physician is done specifically for that purpose. So it raises questions about what we're doing as MDs. So one uh, part of the umbrella term is ingestion or assisted suicide, which is the term we frequently use in Catholic circles to identify what is happening. The other term is euthanasia or injection. So if the pills are given to a patient, in this case, it's the administration of a lethal medication, often through a line, uh, where the physician or NP intends that medication to cause the patient's death as a means of relieving the suffering described by the patient. And the patient's death is caused by that medication. So again, the intentionality of the act is captured in these definitions of made as two things, provision and administration. What we're not talking about today, and this could be the, the part of a whole workshop, but I just want to make this clear, is medical assistance in dying is not the withdrawal or the withholding of life-sustaining technology. 
So what that means for most of us in our experiences, and this was certainly true in my work on the, in, in, in clinical care, is that sometimes a patient might be on a, on a, in the ICU on a ventilator with other technology that is supporting that person's life beyond natural capabilities, and there is no hope for recovery. So the doctors may recommend to you or to me, uh, as a loved one, of our, if our loved one is incapable, that, that the proposed treatment would be comfort care. So they would say it's appropriate to withdraw that life-sustaining technology. When we do that, our intention isn't to end the life of the person on that technology. It's simply to remove the technology that is maintaining a life that otherwise wouldn't be maintained. Does that make sense? So the intentionality here is not to kill the patient. It's to remove something that is artificially, in a sense, sustaining their life. Another term which may not be familiar to many is the term palliative or terminal sedation therapy. So this is something that is done here in your hospice, here in, in, in Prince George. It's done across the country. It is a very specialized intervention when one of our loved ones has intractable suffering, that could be physical or psychological or psychic or spiritual, that nothing we throw at it works to lessen it. So we call that intractable suffering. And with this kind of therapy, the goal is to reduce the consciousness of the person so that they can no longer feel that pain. By doing that, we're not killing the person. We're not intentionally ending their life. We're simply rendering them unconscious so that they don't feel that pain. So again, that's not what we're talking about tonight in terms of maybe this is a legitimate practice carried out in many Catholic hospitals as well as non-Catholic hospitals. And finally, some have argued that we can apply what's called the double effect theory. It's a part of moral reasoning where you can seek to achieve a good, which is to end somebody's suffering. And people have argued that part of double effect here could apply to made where you intentionally do something that is gravely evil in a Catholic understanding, which is to kill a patient. So made is not that in the Catholic moral tradition, because you can't achieve a good by doing something that is wrong. So I'm just going to rule those things out, and I'm happy to come back to them in the question and answer later. So tonight, given the terminology that I've cleared up, and given the, 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 what we're not going to talk about, I want to situate this entire conversation in a world where made is now legal, because it is. And it's highly unlikely that that is going to be reversed. So what do we do in a world where this is now a legal opportunity? The first thing we do is understand the law. So how did Canada get here? There is a history before 2015 that, in, that includes the case of Susan Rodriguez, also from British Columbia. That court case went to the Supreme Court and was a split decision. I want to fast forward to here and talk about what's called the Carter versus Canada case from 2015. And what's helpful to notice on the slide is that the first word of the case title, Carter, comes from actually one of those that are in, 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 in the appeal. So Kay Carter was a woman suffering from a genetic, degenerative spinal stenosis, which is a terrible uh, chronic illness of the back, which we know chronically gets worse. So her idea was, what am I going to do when this illness keeps going down this trajectory where I may not be able to commit suicide on my own because I may be at a point where I'm just unable to do anything. So her question was, and the court argued, that in order to live longer, we need to guarantee a time when someone can assist her in dying when she's unable to do it herself. So I'm going to walk through this again with you. What the court case did is it unanimously struck down the prohibition of helping somebody end their life in certain circumstances. I'm going to walk through what those are. It didn't make aiding and abetting suicide illegal in every case. It made it illegal in most cases except certain circumstances. So what's important to understand are what those five criteria that the Supreme Court said had to be in place for this to be legal. So think about it as a carve out from the criminal code about aiding and abetting suicide. 
Before I get to the five criteria, though, the timing went like this. The court ruled in February of 2015. It realized that because of the major sea change that this would create in healthcare, that Canada would need at least a year before there could be legislation in place and structures in place to permit this legal right. So the government took a little bit longer because in the interim we had an election and the younger Trudeau became our prime minister. And that's why it goes from February to May. So in 2016, the government ruled with legislation and the royal assent was, was delivered a couple of months later. In the process, the terminology moved from physician-assisted dying, which was in the court case, to medical assistance in dying. So what did Bill C-14 make clear? It made five things clear. That if you were going to be eligible for medical assistance in dying, you had to be an adult that was 18 years and older. I'm going to start at the bottom left and work my way around. You also had to be capable of making healthcare decisions right to the end. So this is important because later I'll talk about some developments in thoughts around medical assistance in dying. So you have to be 18 and older. You have to be capable. You have to have what the, the legislation called a grievous and irremediable condition. This includes things like an illness, a disease, and or a disability. You also had to make criteria number four, a voluntary request. Nobody could make the request for you. Nobody could force you to make the request. It had to come from you freely. And finally, you had to give informed consent, again, right up until the end. So that means that in the process we'll talk about later, that at every step along the way that somebody asks to talk about MAID, to request whether they're eligible, they're making a capable decision. So even before somebody is injected, which is the majority way across the country that people access made, we ask the person, is this what you really want? So that's what, what happens with the docs. Let me tell you what was not clear when, when the legislation came out, is that the government added another interesting phrase called, and the death must be reasonably foreseeable. Now, Quebec came out with an assisted dying process for Canada as a country did, and they required that you needed to have, death needed to be reasonably within six months. So this migrates from that kind of a language and actually creates a little bit of an unsure zone about what does reasonably foreseeable death mean. And there are right now some court cases trying to clarify what that means. So what was left off the table that is really important is that on the adult question, we didn't as a country, choose to make this available to children. So you have to be 18 and over. The second thing is we didn't include the idea of advanced consent. Remember I said you have to decide all the way along and right before this happens? With advanced consent, what you'd be able to do is say, I, Christopher, write in my advanced directives that if I can no longer recognize this loved person or that person, or I can no longer do this or that, then that is when I would like my life to be ended through medical assistance in dying. So currently that's not in the law, and it, it was intentionally left out, and I'll tell you why in a minute. The third thing that was left out intentionally is that that grievous and irremediable disease or illness couldn't be, as an underlying illness, mental illness. So the court decided that these three things needed to wait as Canada understands and perhaps changes the way it approaches this. But the government knows that these are burning questions for those who are really pushing for expansion of medical assistance in dying, and has established three expert panels on those three areas. And by the end of 2018, those expert panels and different hospitals and people have been invited, and you can do this. You're invited to respond online to those panels so that you can give your opinions as well. And they're going to be asked to review these issues and how they relate currently to medical systems and dying. Okay. I've been walking through a lot of legal facts, a lot of criteria. What I want to do is switch the gears a little bit and talk to you about the process that is generally in place across the country. Remember that healthcare is provincially delivered. So each province has had to structure its own response to medical systems and dying. And in principle, all provinces and territories have these five steps. The first is that somebody asks. They say, Christopher, as a 
my healthcare provider, I want to talk about medical systems and dying. And the practice ought to be, and, and, and this is the, hopefully the goal across the country, that the first question we ask somebody is, tell me what you mean by this. So I want to understand what your request is. Have you thought about all the options? And I'll tell you a little bit how Providence responds to this. So once we understand what someone's asking for, once we're sure that they're not asking for me because they just don't know how to ask for pain control, for example, um, there is a formal process that requires a form to be filled out with two witnesses saying that this patient is requesting medical assistance in dying. That is followed over the span of, in practice, the normally prescribed period is 10 days, two eligibility assessments by two separate MDs or NPs. So the, the question here is to separate the two people that come to see the patient to find out whether they meet those five criteria. If, that both, if both those assessors agree that the person meets the criteria, then they are eligible for medical assistance in dying. And then finally, there is a final consent asked when medical assistance is completed through injection or ingestion. I mentioned the 10-day waiting period that begins normally with the, the request. There are some cases where the 10-day period gets shortened if the medical team and the patient agree about the, the kind of suffering that is going on. So if that's the facts and the process, we are here gathered as a Catholic community thinking about what our tradition brings to health, to life, to care, so the question I want to explore now with you is what does the Catholic spiritual and moral tradition and organizations that are Catholic offer to this new context where there's been a major sea change? And in the process, I want to ask a deeper question, which is how close do any of us get to the process of made without feeling, hmm, should we even be going anywhere near that? What, what does that look like? So I'd like to suggest from a theological perspective that the lens you bring to anything, this is true in all of our lives, um, can help shine a light on the problem at hand. So we have some really great lenses in the Catholic tradition. I want to speak briefly about them in terms of what we might be trying to think and understand as, as people rooted in our tradition. And to do this, I'm going to take that lens from a really small, tiny, but powerful book that I recommend you order online through Novalis called The Health Ethics Guide. It's only about 10 or $12, you can get it online. And this is the work uh, that, is, that is confirmed by the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops of a group of ethicists, like myself, who have gotten together three times to think about how do changes in healthcare affect the way we as Catholics think about what we ought and ought not to do. It begins with a very powerful image that suggests that if you are in Catholic healthcare, you are really acting like the Good Samaritan, by the, like the person who sees a person in need, gives of yourself, doesn't worry about getting close to someone who is suffering because that's what it takes, creates a system, in partnership in this case with a hotel owner, to care for that person and comes back to check on them. So the idea here is that Catholic healthcare Christian healthcare is rooted fundamentally in helping your neighbor. Again, as I was meeting you tonight, one of the questions was, who's my neighbor? So you see, this is the prophetic conversation about recognizing Christ in everyone. That book also suggests that dignity is intrinsic to being human. So from a Catholic perspective, the conversation, which is sometimes called dying with dignity as a reason for medical assistance in dying, a Catholic would look at that and say, but, but that's not the dignity we're talking about. We're talking about a dignity that is intrinsic to you and me, even if we aren't able to help ourselves, feed ourselves, clean ourselves. Because that dignity we see as God's image in you and me, it is part of what it means to be a human being. A third point in that book, that little book, is that intention matters. So earlier when I was saying that the withdrawal of life support, for example, or the ceasing of a treatment, is not intentionally ending a life. We're made, remember, the lethal medication is given to intentionally end a life. So 
Letting die is not the same in the Catholic moral tradition as making die. And made intentionally makes people die. Two more things to think about from that little book. It cites very clearly that within our moral tradition, there is an exceptionless prohibition against the direct and deliberate hastening of death in order to end suffering. So what that means in another, in other language is we would never kill someone to end their suffering. We would use other means to make them comfortable, to, 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 to reduce suffering where possible through medications, if it's a psychic suffering, through counseling and therapies, but we would never kill a person to end their suffering. At the same time, to counter what is sometimes called uh, vitalist tendencies, i.e. that life it, it must always, 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 always be maintained, the, the text in the guide makes very clear that there is no obligation from a Catholic perspective to use all means possible to extend all life in all cases. So this is really important, and hopefully in our question period we can talk a little bit about those of us that have been in those difficult situations where we needed to make painful decisions about opting for comfort care rather than aggressive care and keeping someone alive on a ventilator, for example. So the key takeaway from this book is that Catholic healthcare, Catholic approaches, want to propose alternatives so that you wouldn't need to ask the question, or if you did ask the question, that the answer wouldn't be medical assistance in dying. So let's think a little bit more deeply now about populations affected by medical assistance in dying, because MAID poses significant risks for vulnerable persons. So what's a vulnerable person? A vulnerable person can be someone who says, oh my goodness, I am such a burden on those people who love me that it would be better if I was dead. That can be a kind of pressure that people communicate, either as a family member, regretfully, or as a clinician, saying, for example, that that life is really not worth living. I can be made to feel a burden if I have that life. So we need to find ways, and there are safety measures that are developing in place, to protect people from choosing to end their lives because they don't feel loved. They feel burdened. The other issue that MAID raises, and this has been in the news across the country, is how individual people who work in healthcare can conscientiously object to being involved in the process. This is a really, really important part of managing healthcare so that we never put someone in a, in a situation where something that is deeply held at a conscious level is forced to be transgressed. And what's true for the individual, Catholic healthcare would argue, is also true for the hospital, which has a conscience. And this brings us to the question of faith-based institutions where issues of how close we get to the process of medical system dying, which is what I'm going to talk about next, uh, takes place. So is it ever permissible for staff in a Catholic hospital to complete MAID in a Catholic hospital? And the answer would be no. That would go counter to our understanding of why we exist. And there's some really interesting discussions happening right now in Belgium about that. There are risks, but there are also tensions. And sometimes when we think about tension, we can say, oh my goodness, we should just stop and get out. Let me just think a little bit with you about tension in the Catholic tradition. I would suggest, both as a moral theologian and as an ethicist, that tensions aren't always a bad thing. You may want to fight, I may want to fight, you may want to flight and flee, and I'll do the same. But I'm suggesting maybe there's a place in the middle. So why would I say that? Because both as an ethicist and as a chaplain, tensions are the reason that people like me, and I'd say you as a compassionate human being, exist. Because we meet people that have a collision of values, they're not sure what to choose. Sometimes people have collisions with other people and we find ourselves at odds with, with each other, and we need assistance to work that tension out. Sometimes in a healthcare environment, we're not sure what the best clinical approach is. Should we offer this plan or that plan? What do we do? 
Ethics can help with that. Sometimes we just need to decide how to structure our organizations, and those always impact people, so there's an ethical piece to that tension as well. You see, for me, and I would suggest for you too, tensions are normal and ought not to be avoided. We know this is true in all of our relationships. They reveal complexities that are often not black and white, and they ought to be engaged because the way we engage them says something about who we are as a church and people. And sometimes, and I've seen this in my own life, they reveal alternatives and options that no one thought about before. And I think Catholic healthcare is now being challenged to think about how to talk about the opportunities and alternatives that we see when people ask for medical assistance in dying. But it is a perfect storm. I put up, I'm going to put two slides up now that talk about the kinds of media attention that anyone involved in this discourse at a front end level like, like we are has, has seen. So one heading is simply that religion ought to get out of the healthcare business. Another one is why should we be funding Catholic healthcare or faith based healthcare with your tax dollars and mine if they won't do everything? So can they ethically refuse? And thirdly, in terms of hospice beds, we know that on the island there was a conversation about where ought those hospice beds to go and could they live within a Catholic faith-based organization? And those beds were decided by the health authority to be taken out of the faith-based health authority, faith-based uh, group. These are public records closer to where I come from and I work. Uh, on the far left, there's a picture of our then chair of the board saying that we will not perform aid at, at Providence Healthcare. And on the right, there's a, a transfer that, that made it to the news because we don't allow the completion of medical assistance in dying on our site, but we arrange for transfer. Um, thankfully, our transfers recently have, have not caused any kinds of challenges like that uh, and have not, uh, not been in the news in that way. But you look at the other pieces, should hospitals be that, that, that deny assisted denying, you know, be closed? Is there a question of ditching dog? Are they harming patients? I put those up because we live in a world of media, and these stories are there in front of you and me. And one of the other stories that we need to understand is just how many people are accessing medical assistance and dying. So the stats I have up there are from June 2016 to April 2017, so just a bit under a year. What it tells us is that less than 1% of all the deaths in the country took place through MAID. And the numbers on the right show you the provincial numbers. I'm going to zero in in a moment on the numbers in British Columbia because they are a bit interesting proportionally. So in our province of British Columbia, the average use of medical assistance in dying is twice the national average. And when you push further onto Vancouver Island, it increases to about six and a half, six times. But that's not the whole story, because a group of people obviously accessing MAID is important to know. But when we turn the lens on our own Catholic community and look at some of the surveys that have been done, there's actually some disturbing trends about how Catholics think about medical assistance in dying. And this raises an important piece which we're talking about today with the clergy, but how to talk about end-of-life care within our own faith communities. Because in 2014, there was a poll, a cross-Canada poll by Angus Reid, that had some very good credibility that suggested that 80% of the population in Canada, if asked whether they support medical system dying, would say yes. Where I want to draw your attention to is where the star is that suggests that 46 plus 22% of church-going Catholics answered moderately to strongly, also approving euthanasia. So it's not clear in the way that they answered that question whether what was in the back of their mind is, I would support it because I certainly don't want a painful death. We're not quite sure what those reasons are, but the numbers would suggest that if it was just about a democratic voting issue, Catholics would score in this almost 70th percentile, and the general population scores in 80. So what does that tell us? I'm going to step back again as a theologian now with you and say that 
oh my goodness, we could say this is such an awful crisis, but the church ought not to be afraid. This is part of why we gather as a faith community in good times and in bad of a crisis. And Timothy Radcliffe, who writes a really interesting book called What's the Point of Being a Christian, suggests that the church was born in a crisis of hope. And crises are what make our specialité de la maison, or that they're the special dish of, our, of, of who we are because they actually help us reimagine and rejuvenate ourselves. So let's not be afraid of crisis. Let's approach crisis in a way that asks the questions, what is really going on when someone asks for aid? And what is really going on when we try to seriously understand something that is quite mysterious? Because that is how the church grows as well, it's asking the difficult questions. And we are impoverished if we don't. And we will make some mistakes. It's pretty hard to think about how to ask and talk with somebody about their request. And we'll talk a little bit about that today too. And finally, I'd like to suggest if we take a really big step back to the heart of, of our faith, that to be a Christian actually is about living a mystery. That mystery includes living and dying, but it also means profoundly living in such a way that your life and mine makes no sense if God did not exist. It's a really important thing for you and me to think about in our witness to our faith. Because the point of any religion is to point us to God, who is the point of everything, again, says Timothy Radcliffe. And at the end of this talk, I'm going to recommend a book for you to read by a pediatrician and a nun, who reminds us that maybe this whole conversation of ending, ending our lives through medical means is that we've forgotten what the Paschal Mystery teaches us about living and dying. So let me tell you something that you may not know. Before MAID was legal, 8 to 22% of any patients that were in a life uh, complicated situation, an end of life situation, would say to us as clinicians, I wish I was dead. It's not uncommon for people to say, This is awful, I want it to end. What's different now is that there's a legal option in the country for that to happen. So how do we respond to that? Because the question has existed for a very, very long time. I can tell you where we're not doing very well is we're not actually training people well enough to respond to that question. Already in 2013, there was a report out that what's kind of terrifying is that Canadian doctors don't receive enough training on answering that question. And I would argue that that's also true for other allied healthcare professionals and as I look at you and look at me and my own family, how would we respond if somebody said to you, Christopher, I wish I were dead? I would like to suggest that part of your response can be to hear that request for made as a deep cry coming from a place of suffering. So your first goal and my first goal and our clinical first goal is to ask, how do I respond to someone who thinks, who asks, that I want this to end? So let me map that out with an example, a real anonymized example. So I'd like you to meet Anna, who's 54 years old, who began to note some weakness in her hands about 15 months ago. Her family physician refers her to a neurologist. That neurologist makes a diagnosis of ALS. She gets followed in an ALS clinic, and for a year she has home care. But as the months progress, Anna begins to note progressive weakness. She has difficulty standing. She can no longer walk the way she does. And she's even beginning to have swallowing difficulties, all chronic examples of what happens with ALS. And she's aware that her prognosis is just going to get worse. Now, before the illness, Anna worked as a freelance designer. She has also has no extended healthcare benefits because she was freelance. And she's now on CPP disability. When you ask her how she's feeling, she says, I feel useless. I'm afraid of the burden that this will place on my family. 
I am so angry that I must die from this terminal disease. On a personal note, she was divorced, but for the last six years, she's found a new love that has given her great hope that love was possible again. Her partner, Jim, lives with her, and Anna has one son, one daughter, and four grandchildren, all of whom live nearby. And then comes the question. One day in the clinic, your regular appointment, she says to her team, I would like a referral for physician assisted suicide, medical assistance, and dying. The team then says, let's get together and think about this. Now you've heard this case, and I'm going to show you where the team went with just thinking a little bit about this request. Some of the interesting things to think about with Anna's story is first of all to note the process issues. What are we trying to evaluate here? What is she really asking for? Remember that process I said when someone asks you, Chuck, what's the real suffering? Tell me about it. What are your options? Note also the medical and psychosocial spiritual contextual issues. What's the bigger issue with Anna's life around feeling like a burden? Feeling useless? What does that say about who I am or Anna is as a person when if I can't do what I normally do, if I'm going to be a burden on my family, then somehow that's something that needs to be made go away and there isn't a solution out there in the community to assist a person who's been contributing for their whole life at this stage. And for the healthcare team, remember the other issues I was raising about just how close do we get to it? What's the team feeling when they're being asked to participate, either in this case for or not for, that being a solution to end a person's life? I raise these things because a critical question for us with this new sea change is we need to understand why people ask to hasten their death. <coughs> So what's the wish to hasten death? Research tells us, and we intuitively go in a slightly different direction, research tells us, of course, that it is multifactorial. Most of us think that the reason people ask for physician assisted dying or medical assistance in death is because there is intense physical pain. The research actually shows that that's not the case. Most people choose medical assistance in dying for psychosocial and spiritual reasons, not physical ones. And what are those psychosocial and spiritual ones? It's the reduced ability to take part in the things that I love to do. It's the fear of unmanageable symptoms, often because we've seen somebody many years ago die with that kind of stuff, but we're so much better now at pain management. It can also be the loss of autonomy in my social role. Think back to Anna. If I can't be a freelancer, if I can't be a grandmother in the way that I'm used to, what good am I? It can also be the sense of being a burden on other people, physically, socially, financially. People will also use language, and again, we have to understand the perception that people are using, that, that I don't feel dignified when I can't be in control, when I can't do the things I want to do. And this brings a loss of meaning and a loss of control in general. And in some cases, and you may have seen the Dr. Lowe video where before Dr. Lowe died, before this was legal in Canada, he was arguing for it. And part of what he said is, I want to be able to control what I do. I, I don't want someone to have to wipe me or clean me. So if the wish to hasten death is more psychosocial, you also need to know that with, the research shows that the requests come in a fluctuating way. They're not always stable. So the feeling comes and goes. And sometimes the request to hasten death is actually accompanied not by a genuine desire to die, but because somebody wants help to know how to live. And other studies have shown that people do change their minds when they're given new options. Let me give you an example of where ingestion methods of, of medical assistance in dying teaches something about why people ask for it and how they use it. 
In Oregon, where the only way that you can get a physician-assisted suicide is through a prescription of drugs that you take yourself, only 65% of people that get the prescriptions use them. So that's made some people think about, what are the other 35% doing? And it's quite possible that they just want it as an insurance for if things really, really, really get bad. So again, it creates a little bit of space in the conversation for some. So what might a pastoral response with the church and a clinical response that's informed by Catholic health care think about? I would like to suggest to all of us that the first thing we do is we listen and not judge. Somebody is in a place of pain and they're asking for something that you may not want, I may not want, but we need to hear that suffering. We need to help people search for alternatives. And in a Catholic tradition, those alternatives need to affirm the dignity of a person at every turn. So if that's true, one of the key moral insights that we have to grapple with is not whether Catholic healthcare would ever condone or participate in MAID. Clearly, that's not the case. But we live in a world where we're going to find ourselves sometimes walking side by side with people who are asking for that. So how close do you and I get to that? Certainly, as a healthcare system, we need to think about what we do and don't do. But as people across the country are talking, eventually you're going to know somebody that is thinking about this. So what kind of a conversation can you have with your friend? For those with the training in Catholic moral theology, this is often called cooperation in the moral tradition. So there's some key cooperation issues which are just really understand how close can we get. And the issue of conscientious objection I've already spoken about is not unique to faith-based healthcare or Catholic. There are many people that come from no tradition that see this as a conscience issue as well. But in the Catholic center, there's at least three major concerns. So although we will never perform medical assistance in dying, there's a process to get there. So what do we do with assessments? Where do they happen and how? We also live in a system here where we've got larger health authorities, where hospitals are part of larger systems. So that creates cooperation issues just automatically because we're sharing resources and we're sharing staff, etc. And then there's the issue of geography. If one is the only Catholic hospital in a small town, that means someone has to travel a lot further if they would like to get medical assistance in dying. So that poses some real logistical challenges as well. But let's go back to the parish. So how do we think about the sacraments in relation to a request for medical assistance in dying? And how do we as family members talk to each other when a loved one says, this is what I would like to do, what I'd like to talk to you about. So interestingly, about a year ago when I arrived here, we were in the thick of these conversations. We brought a group of ethicists together um, to start working out a, a focused Catholic response uh, to this issue. And one of the things we determined in terms of policy and approach, and this is shared across the country in Catholic organizations, but in my own our policy identifies that we always acknowledge requests. We don't turn a deaf ear, we don't say you're not asking for this. We do what I'm recommending you do as well, which is listen intently for the suffering. We offer alternatives. We offer palliative care. We offer hospice care. Because we believe that excellent palliative care and hospice care can remedy suffering and angst. We also, in principle, do not allow assessments to happen in Catholic hospitals. But there are some difficult times where that needs to happen. And we clearly indicate to staff and to patients that if they are seeking the provision of MAID, that they will be transferred to a non-objecting site for further discussion about medical assistance and dying. So this policy or this approach offers us a way to think about the experience uh, that we are having now a year and a few months in. And this is what we're learning. We're learning that every case is different. We learn from each case. We're also learning that the longer we engage with people in care, we find that in, in some cases, people realize that what they thought they wanted, which was made, is not what they want. They experience a community, for example, for the first time and choose to remain in our care. 
And we also know that our staff are willing to do the hard work to walk with people to understand their suffering. These are vulnerable patients. We get attached to them. And what you need to know across the country is that as people ask about MAID, only about 25% of those cases move to completion. That means 75% either aren't eligible, change their minds, or otherwise choose not to have medical systems in dying. So our emerging experience is that people will ask for MAID whether you're in a Catholic facility or not. But when those people ask, there are three kinds of people, or three groups of people, that ask for it. One asks for it because they just need to know whether they're eligible in case they need it. So they may not want to operationalize it, they just want it, as one patient said, as a card in my back pocket. Some people ask for it because they just don't know what else to ask for. They want relief, and they've heard that this might give it to them. And that group, again, is open to a lot of discussion because there are other options. We've also discovered there's a group that is very committed from the get-go to medical assistance in dying, and they've got a fixed intent for that. So if the options are offered and disposed or, or denied, these are patients that would need to transfer to another site that is able and capable of performing what it is they want to keep talking about, but we can't do that. So I'd like to just draw this to a close by saying that a behind-the-scenes question about this engagement that I'm talking about with you, how to think about the question, how to remain with patients, how to offer alternatives, can also be understood to have another question, which is, Maybe we should just get out of healthcare altogether. It's a little cleaner. You don't have to deal with this ambiguity. We don't do that stuff. I would like to suggest that this juncture that is entirely a premature question. For all the reasons that we've been talking about tonight, the wonderful conversation with our clergy today, the Catholic tradition has a lot to offer to how we understand life, suffering, and death and I have learned through my work, and I just want to cite one of the ethicists that I've worked with, that if we're no longer in the game, if we're no longer at the table, we're no longer a voice. So of course there are things, and Edmund Pellegrino was correct, that we cannot do as Catholics. There are things that we just cannot do. But hostility and tension doesn't mean we have to run from the conversation I hope Canada is large enough to have a diversity of opinions around the diversity of options that are available to people who are suffering. So I'm arguing that it's important for you and for me to advocate with our voices that there be a place for the contribution of Catholic health care for the public. Because it's not, obviously, for Catholics. Catholic health care has always been, in this province, for the health of all British Columbians. The founding sisters didn't say you had to be Catholic to come to our hospitals. In fact, they sought out every marginalized group possible to provide that care. And today we can do the same. So I suggest that integrated thought about this is really critical. So where have we been? We've been on a little bit of a journey to say that clearly medical systems in dying falls outside of our faith tradition and the Catholic moral tradition. But the suffering that generates that never has. Because someone will ask for it today, tomorrow, and did 10 and 15 years ago. And the best of our tradition embraces compassion and suffering. But we will never hasten someone's death intentionally. So we explored the loving and merciful options. We talked about palliative care. I made reference to hospice care, which is a place where people can die in peace and comfort here in your community. So I advocate for excellent palliative care, excellent hospice care, and remind you that Canada doesn't yet have a national strategy for either. And I also encourage you as people of faith, people interested in this conversation, to, to go to conversations like this where you can think about this, talk at your dinner tables about what would happen when, so that if you are making a substitute decision for someone, you know the wishes of your mom, your dad, your your spouse, your son, your daughter. And I think we need to ensure that there is a health system with options that respect the dignity of life, that offers alternatives, that protects conscience. And that is a culture that we can build to protect 
the most vulnerable. So I'm going to close now by referencing just this one book that I, that I mentioned. Again, um, easily available through any of the major book providers. It's called Rediscovering the Art of Dying. It's by this pediatrician who's also a religious nun, Nuna Kenny. And Nuna has a fundamentally important point in this book. And that is, is that in a society that has forgotten the Christian narrative, we can seek only a medical solution to our pain and suffering. But you and I know the beauty of our faith tradition is that the Paschal mystery is what we live. We believe in life, but we also believe in life after life. We also believe in Christ's resurrection. The Paschal mystery is one way to educate ourselves of what our tradition teaches about a meaningful life. So I'm going to stop there, and in a moment we will shut off the, the YouTube part. But I just want to say to everybody online, thank you for listening. And uh, thank you for those of you in the room for listening to this lecture. I look forward to a conversation about the questions that it raises. So thank you, everybody.